Blake calls his mother. I'm your host, Sadia. This is my mother, Ima. Hey, Ima. Love you. Oh, that coffee, the chutzpah coffee. Me and your wife have almost finished it off. Yeah, it means good coffee. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about something. A funny thing uh, occurred to me was um, that I remember there was one. I have a coffee grinder. Yeah. But um, it was there at Pesach and the Rav Paskin that, no, I could not use my coffee grinder on Pesach because since I had it on my counter during the regular year with the chametz, that my chametz might have gotten into it, whatever, you know, it's not allowed to use it on Pesach. So I was too cheap to want to buy another coffee grinder for Pesach. So I figured, okay, maybe I'll Pesach. I'll use just, you know, regular ground coffee or I'll just use, you know, instant. Well, someone gives me these real, a bag of these real good gourmet beans. And it's Pesach and I can't use my coffee grinder. They're whole beans. So... I think to myself, how badly do I want to try this really fine, good, whole bean gourmet coffee? Well, you know me, the coffee addict. So I put the beans in a couple plastic bags. I take a hammer and I just fashion them up to try to, you know, to make it for Pesa. Was it delicious? Wasn't worth the effort. <laughs> so, okay, was... uh, the first question we have was, I know we talked about um, the times you traveled outside of America, but once you came back from America, what was anything that you noticed about either uh, about being in America or being in the other other countries that you there that you missed? Um, I noticed America in general. Um, first of all, is one run a lot more efficiently. I know that. A lot of people were saying, oh, you got to be kidding me, you know, especially with lately <laughs> airplanes, you know, being the cancellations and late flights. But um, this is in uh, the first trip I took was in the 1970s. And coming back, it was like, you know, um, the airplanes were on time. It, things were more efficient. You know, you have you have a meeting. You're supposed to be there at a certain time. Americans make sure they are there at that time in a lot of foreign countries. Um, you have a meeting for a time and people strut in a half an hour later or don't show up at all. It's, um, I don't know what it is. So you're like, they're, so, they're more lackadaisical in a lot of other countries about, you know, being punctual and about meeting deadlines. Um, also, I noticed like consumer products, you know, tissues, uh, toilet paper, you know, everything, you know, that we use every day, paper towels. We we have an abundance here. It's no question about it. Go to the store for a dollar, two dollars, buy a big box of tissues, whatever. Whereas in a lot of foreign countries, especially in the Middle East, tissues are a very big luxury. Mm. Especially in Israel. So, you know, um, I told you about what happened at that hotel in, in Israel with the one box of tissues. <laughs> that Misa. Well, yeah. Well, when you came back from you know your trip and then you decided to, to go on this journey of becoming more observant you went to crown heights what was your first impression of crown heights and i guess michael khana well first of all the um well i hadn't gone to michael khana yet i came um i came there the first time i came there it was erif pesach to um no i came for a pagisha what's a pagisha the pagisha um it's a like a conclave like a convention uh, the Chabad has in December, and they have one, uh, they have one conclave for women and one for young men. One for young women, one for young men, or you know, women. One's a women's uh, convention. Yeah, one's men. Yeah. So, um, when I was the first day I was here in Crown Heights, I'm walking down Kingston Avenue, and I hear people. I see people walking into each other and saying, "But saying there's going to be a Fabring in this Fabring in tonight, Fabring in tonight." Fabring. And I couldn't get over how word of mouth spread very, very quickly. Um, this was before the age of cell phones. Yeah. This is like in the 19, early 1970s. And people were just passing the word along, along Kingston Avenue. It's going to be a BFA bring in tonight, BFA bring in tonight, BFA bring in tonight. BFA, you know, um, I couldn't get over the closeness of the community. Also, how quickly um, things were communicated from person to person like that along the street. Um, I was also impressed um, with... Uh, when I first, when I finally, when I moved to the community, 
and started to go back to Hong Kong. I had a basement apartment. And what happens, I was supposed to, I wanted to be in the dormitory. And as I, the day before I was supposed to leave, I get a notice that the dormitory is full. So my mother says to me, um, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go, I'll go anywhere and take my chances. I already planned this. So I went up to New York and um, I went to the office at Mahon, to the dormitory at Mahon, where they also had the office at the time. And they called um, this woman in the community who uh, said she would take me, you know, she would, she would take me for a while, you know, till I could find a place in uh, Crown Heights. I couldn't get over it all, also, also like the Achnosus Orchim, how, how quickly they were able to call somebody and somebody was able was actually said right away, yeah, sure, you know, to send her over here. So I went to this woman's home and then um, she um, I got on the phone with uh, her friend, this one was Sarah Keller. And she gets on the phone with a friend of hers. It was um, actually, it was a, uh, it was Mrs. Bugamilski, the Rabbi, Rabbi Velvel Bugamilski, who writes the book, um, Vidi Barta Bum, wrote the series. That was her, that was, um, she was his, she was his wife. And so she, um, they were on the phone together. We were talking in Yiddish and Hebrew. And what they were saying was that Mrs. Bugamilski said that her basement was empty. She had, a, she had a very nicely furnished basement that she wanted to rent out. And one of the tenants had recently moved out and she said it was it was available. So um, I didn't realize that that was the conversation. Like I said, it was in Hebrew and Yiddish. And so the lady I was staying by goes, oh, this is a good shidduch, meaning it's a good match. I, you know, we can match her up with your you know basement apartment. And I thought, are these cre crazy people trying to marry me off? Because all I knew about shidduch and like shidduch you know, with me, with my limited knowledge of Yiddish, I knew the shidduch was supposed to be a marriage match, you know, and when I hear the word shidduch, I go, wait a minute, what am I getting myself into? Are these people marrying me? I said, so I said to this lady who was, who was here and go, wait a minute, I'm not ready to get married. And she looks at me, she cracks up laughing. <laughs> she goes, of course you're not. What the? And so I, I said, but I heard, I heard the word shidduch. She goes, I meant it was a good match that my friend has a basement apartment available for you. So it's a good match. That's actually also brings it to another good question. I just thought of how did you figure out the from lingo and from let like a uh, dialect? Um, I don't know. You get, you know, something where thank God, wherever I am, wherever I've been, I've been able to pick up languages very easily. I was in Italy for just two weeks. Mm -hmm. And by the end of those two weeks, I was actually speaking Italian. Well, to people um scusi and, <laughs> and you know wherever i they, and so when i was in crown heights i picked up a lot of yiddish and hebrew um forgot a lot of it when i went when i returned to baltimore so, you know so then my uh, mm -hmm. adding, adding oh and the one more thing when yeah. i was when, so when i went when i finally moved to my base apartment and i started working and you know going to Macon um there was on um, one a couple of days where i got sick you know a lot of times it happens when you new, move to a new place your body has an, you know, your immune system hasn't adjusted to whatever new viruses or germs are in that area. Yeah. And it happens a lot of times when you move to new places that for the first couple months or so, you, you get sick quite often. So when I finally recovered in a couple of days, I was in my basement apartment by, you know, you know, uh, getting, you know, well, and when I was finally well, and I was able to go to show people came over to me and asked me where I was. Was I okay? I was surprised because I grew up in the suburbs where you know, middle class suburbs, uh, you could die and they wouldn't know until yeah. they complained about the, to the police about the smell, you know. Exactly. But it, I was um, very impressed how the people in this community were actually involved in each other and actually worried about each other. So when you, so I, I know we talked off the podcast about your experience on in Tish, on Tishbab in Israel because you were you were in Israel during the, around the nine days Tishbab time. Can you tell me a little bit more about that experience of Tisha B'Av and understanding that, that it was different from when you were growing up, where all you knew was it was some holiday you learned in Hebrew school? Yeah, well, I remember the joke about Tisha B'Av was, you know, for people who learned it, we always learned it very quickly. It was always at the end of the book, you know, the end of the the how, the um, you know, the Jewish book about, you know, holidays that were celebrated. Tisha B'Av was always at the end because it's during the summertime. So most non-religious Jews don't really know about Tisha B'Av. And so the question is, you know, uh, is it two B'Shvat? Is it Tisha B'Av? Uh, which is which? <laughs> it sounds similar. <laughs> um, so when I was in Israel um, and um, we uh, was with a group of uh, 
young from people who uh, were all Bali Chuva and they were going to Yeshiva Hartzian. So um, the Sudas Ma'asekas was we were supposed to sit down and said, you know, eat the egg, dick, and ash. So I thought you were supposed to eat the ashes. So I said, okay, if this is what God wants of me, this is what God wants of me. And I ate the egg with the, <laughs> the ashes. <laughs> yeah, there's, it's so funny because like, you know, in Frumkite, everyone thinks like it's more, you know, people who don't know anything about Frumkite think of it more as like some kind of strange cult or this like obsession of needing to do things for the glory of God. And like in the Frum world, it's very practical and very much like realistic where like, no, it says in the Tartu this, you have to do this. We try to do what we can. You know, we're not perfect. And we're we're not, we don't believe in a perfect human being. You know, you, we just, we believe in doing the best you can. And and there's parts of like halacha where like, when you talk to a rabbi and, and you try to break down the, you know, what you can and can't do on some sorts, most of the time, you know, they'll be understanding and, and help you, guide you to choose to get to the best, you know, conclusion. Um but with Tisha B'av, it's a lot of people read, uh, you know, tragedies that happened throughout you know, the years. Um, I had a friend who used to, she used to pay her bills on Tisha B'av. She said that tragedy enough for her. It's cute. Uh, did Ellie, did you, you met Ellie Weisel, right? I didn't meet him, but I went to one, I went to a talk that he had. He, it was at, um, uh, Oh, have show over here in Baltimore. And, um, he came there and gave a talk and, um, was very, um, he said um, that he felt that we were, he said he felt that we were on the cusp of the coming of Mashiach because in those days, um, young men, you know, college boys, it was very in for college boys to grow beards. Um, also, they came up with the prairie dresses. So you had young girls wearing the, you know, prairie dresses, which went all the way down to the ground. Yeah. So he says, look around, he goes, who is wearing the long skirts now? The young girls says, who's growing the beards? Not the old men, the young men. So he felt that Diamond Mashiach was supposed to be topsy-turvy. And uh, he felt that this was an indication that we were definitely on the on the verge of the coming of Mashiach. Did did you really know about Mashiach when you were younger? Or or what was your first exposure to understanding Mashiach? Um, we, we had heard about it here and there, but it's very interesting about, um, you have a, even in those days, even today, you have a lot, you had a lot of from people, um, especially like the Hebrew teachers, whatever, who um, didn't really believe in the coming of Mashiach. In fact, I, I spoke, there was a, recently, just a few years ago, I spoke to this, um, uh, this lady who's a from Jew. And when I told, when I, we were talking about the coming of Mashiach, she just laughed at me. And she said to me, oh, come on. Do you really believe in the covenant? Really? A few years ago? Just a few years ago. And I said, I said to her, man, I said, the, I said, the idea of the belief in Mashiach is one of the basic 13 principles of our faith. So what do you mean to, you know, laughing at me? What do you mean, do I be really believe in the coming of Mashiach? I said, of course I do. Um, it was very interesting. And also when I was in college, I read an interesting book um, that one of my friends was into that he influenced me to read. He wasn't Jewish, by the way. But um, the book was named The Rebellion of Yale Marat by um, uh, the guy's name was Bob Rimmer. Mm -hmm. It was the guy's name who wrote the book. Basically, it was one of these books that was the heyday of the sexual revolution at the time of the late 60s, early 70s. And in that book, there's um, a young non-Jewish man who's dating this Jewish girl. And she invites him to come over to her house, you know, for the weekend, she wants to introduce him to the family. And he's debating the, you know, Jewish theology with her brother. And he goes over the 13 principles of the, uh, he, even though he's not Jewish, he's familiar with the 13 principles of, um, a very, you know, the Rambam. Yeah. And he says, and he, in this, and he goes through all 12 of the principles. And then he says to the, and, so, and then he says to the boy, to the girl's brother, and by the way, there's one, there's one last one. And her brother says, what? He goes, I believe in the coming of the Messiah. And that's the end of the chapter. And that, that particular book, when the non-Jewish boy says the Jewish boy, because he had read the, you know, he had, he had yeah. read this on his own. He leaves that as a very, you know, like, um, yeah. uh, like a climax mm -hmm. for the end of the chapter. And um, so it was like, um, I was me and this uh, non-Jewish boy that, um, 
and we're friends, you know, we were wondering, is uh, Bob Rimmer Jewish? What's going on? And um, we weren't sure. And I think back, I know Rimmer's a Jewish name, so it could very well be that um, this author Bob Rimmer was Jewish. We could look into that later on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, wait. so uh, yeah, so I, you know, every now and then there there were mentions, but it wasn't at the forefront, mm -hmm. you might say. The big deal when I was going to Hebrew school, the big deal was the state of Israel. That was the big deal. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and for when the Rebbe decided to make a, like a campaign, you might say about the coming of Mashiach, um, I was in New York at the time, you know, I was still in New York, I think it was like 1974, 75, whatever, I was still attending Beis Rivka and Mechon Chana. Boy, did Chabad get a lot of backlash for that. There were a lot of non, um, there were a lot of uh, like Stama, you know, your your regular West Ashkenazic Jewish groups mm -hmm. that were really up in arms about the Rebbe talking about Mashiach. And I remember Shmuel Kaplan, um, uh, at that time, he had some sort of uh, program on the radio. And he said, he gave the number of times in the regular Ashkenazic davening that the coming of Mashiach is mentioned. And he came up with this, I don't know what number, he came up with this tremendous number. He says, so he says, you're getting on Chabad's case from the mentioning of the coming of Mashiach. He says, look at your own Sidurim. Look how often you daven for the coming of Mashiach in the course of just one day. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Um, it's, it's, I mean, growing up Lubavitch in a non-Lubavitch environment, um, they would poke fun at me and make fun of me about, about Mashiach, even though Mashiach is something that's like very important in Jewish life and and, and in the Torah and, and and philosophy and in Kabbalah. It's always about redemption. So that's what we're always looking forward to. Um, I, I believe it's the gullus mentality from a lot of these poor people that have been deeply rooted in the uh, typical European, you know, gullus oppression that's been bled into the generations um it's just i i i've mentioned this a couple of times in different uh, um different episodes um about that one time we were going on the hanukkah parade and i was in the car with this non-jewish police officer and we were escorting the parade and we went through the jewish community um and we went down um one street that's very from and this one from guy literally was running and screaming at the top of his lungs, like, this isn't helping. You're not doing anything good. You're you're wasting your time. You're you're Mabata Tyra. You're all just horrible people. And just were just saying a bunch of nasty stuff and just yelling at us. And the officer was like confused. He's like, What's going on? Like, I don't, I don't get it. And he looked at me for answers. And I'm like, some people just don't like knowing there's a redemption. I, would, I mean, I, I would I would say that gentleman needs a good psychiatrist. Yeah, they <laughs> try, they, that guy is um he must be some crazy guy. <laughs> I pretend not to know the guy. Um, no, it's just it's it's like some people say like you know well you know some people just aren't proud to be Jewish. I think, I think some well yeah they're not proud. That's what the Rebbe is all about. It's about spreading pride into being Jewish because right after the Holocaust the pride was pretty pretty low. But what I find also but fascinating though is I don't think as far as belief in the coming of Mashiach I don't think the Sephardic Jews ever had that problem. Like the Ashkenazic, like I said, European, the, so the European Gullus, uh -huh. and and they yeah. have that mentality, and they have their whole idea. I think there's also something too. Western thought, basically, yeah. Western education, Western thought, is very concrete and logical and practical and very logical. It might go back to the five. I guess well, I mean, back to the five that, 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 that yeah. doesn't make any sense because other countries, but, 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 other but, but, Eastern yeah. Eastern cultures have logic to them. Yeah, it's, talking about it. No, I think Western, what it boils down that okay. Western thought, a lot of Western thought, yeah, is not is not spiritual. Whereas your Eastern thought, your so far, I mean, your Eastern thoughts in general, Eastern philosophies tend to be more spiritual. You know, you know, Christianity for the past 2000 years in Europe was very spiritual. I think what I really mm -hmm. think what it boils down to is these poor saps of Jews were just beaten down for 
2000 years and they couldn't wrap their head around a concept that hey maybe we can be redeemed maybe maybe there's an end to this and they're just obsessed with feeling bad about themselves obsessed with feeling bad about everything you know it's coming up to tish above it's a whole joke uh, um you know what what's Masnag uh, Masnaga's favorite holiday it's tish above because he gets to be sad <laughs> it's like they just they they want to be sad they want to be upset and and they have to wrap their they, they can't wrap their head around the idea that hey maybe this is all going to be over hey maybe you know it's going to get better a well, funny side story to this is um, uh, what the um, our dormitory counselor, Shirley Groner, mm -hmm. at the time, her father um, was Yitzhak Groner, the Shaliach in Australia. And um, she was um, uh, she was invited. There was some sort of like convention of Orthodox Jewish women, whatever. And they wanted Chabad represented. Um, they asked her to come and talk. So when she came, so this woman who's in charge of the convention says to her, I hope you're not going to talk about the coming of Mashiach. So Shruni says to her, no, I'm going to talk about Abbas Yisrael. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I've gotten that over the years. Like, just... Now, when I talk about logic, here's, here's what I mean. Okay. Okay, because okay, I've, I've met a lot of... I've met a lot of, like, your Litvish and your German Jews. That has to do with practicality, understanding the Mara versus understanding Hasidus and that's that that the German culture what was the German culture basically the German university the ger you know logic logic a lot intellectual cold intellectual logic not something that's very very spiritual and I think that mindset has that mindset worked to influence a lot of Ashkenazic Jews especially those of German and Litvish background I even have trouble with a lot of Litvish Jews people of like Litvish's German background, they don't even believe in the Medrash. When you quote the Medrash to them, they go, oh, it's only Medrash, only Medrash. So I said to somebody like that, wait a minute, I said, Rashi quotes Medrash. Well, I, you know, I don't believe in the Medrash. As a matter of fact, and his own daughter at their Shabbos table, she goes to Jewish school and she learns Medrash and she goes, wait a minute. That he goes, I believe in Medrash. I learned Medrash at school. Because he just wanted to hate on Chabad. That's the point. They'll make up excuses. I I I don't care to make up excuses for people that are that are really vile with that. People that are vile against Lubavitch and really vile against Hasidus and really vile against another Yid on that level. It 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 it's just there's something's cracked in their skull. Because the point, the point is when you have all these different types of Jews respecting each other's philosophies, respecting each other's ideas. That's the whole point of, you know, avas chinam and understanding and bringing the geula by, by being that way. And when you mention the geula, you mention avas Yisrael, there's such a yetzahara for that. Like it's, it's, it's a type of yetzahara that they have to dive into that. They just feel like they have to, they, they have a need to embrace the fact that no, Mashiach is not going to come. No, we don't believe in Chassidus. No, we don't believe in the Medrash. No, we don't believe in, like, there's there's something wrong with them mentally. I feel there's something really wrong with them deep in a very mental psychological state that their whole, I think their whole family on a generational level and generational trauma level has been beaten into this philosophy because they're too afraid to admit that hey maybe this is over because they can't wrap their head around that. They need to be in gullus. They want to be in gullus. They have that gullus mentality. They they need to have that feeling of dread. It's what bothers me. I said this in the first episode of our podcast. It bothers me to see all these Jews like obsessed with the whiny, obnoxious, freaking, you know, just that was, whiny Jew. That was, whiny. Was, what's so funny? Like when you mentioned like the whiny, downbeaten Jew. What does everybody think of? Who does everybody think of? They, Woody they, Allen. Every, isn't it funny? It's like Woody Allen is the personification of the downbeat. It's, but he's not the only. Yeah. He's the most famous one in a way because that that's how he sold. Judaism and everyone loved it because like laughing at him like a clown and that's the problem you know I, I that's why I watch I watch some comedians and they use they use their Judaism as a punching bag like oh I'm Jewish but I'm not that Jewish <laughs> or it's like uh you know there's a difference between Orthodox and Hasidic Jews Hasidic Jews are like these crazy people that like you know role play all the time and Orthodox Jews just kind of are nerds about it like well I, I remember when I when I decided to make the commitment to, you know, to join Chabad, yeah. I uh, came back to Baltimore, you know, for a visit. And I was at some sort of like a Jewish social um, event, outside social event. And um, I think it might be simplest based on Shoeva. 
And I came across this girl who I had been friends with in high school. And I said, she goes, what are you doing? It's Jewish girl. And so I said to her, oh, I said, I um, I joined the Hasidic movement. I joined Chabad. And she looks me up and down. She goes, you're not dressed any different. <laughs> you know, I go, she was, I don't know what she was expecting. She was expecting maybe uh, black stockings and a black shawl or what, something, whatever. But she just looked at me, she goes, well, you're, you're not dressed. Uh, it's... You know, you're dressed, you're still dressed pretty modern. I'm... Well, no, they're expecting it to be more of like, you know, Tivian from a, 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 from the freaking... Uh, Fiddler on the Roof, another way to go ahead and portray our people as some schlubs. Like, it just, it's frustrating, especially when I see in the media. I still like the same stockings in Williamsburg. Mm. Yeah, I told the head of my school, I said I liked them, I was going to get a pair. She said, you show up in those things, I'm throwing you out of the building. <laughs> seamless stocking? What do you mean, seamless? Seam, the seam, the seam stockings. They have, uh, a lot of the Satmar women wear stockings that have a seam, like a dark, you know, years ago, I remember my mother having them like, like when nylon stockings first came out in the 40s and 50s. Yeah. There was a seam, like a black line, like a black seam or a dark seam in the back of the stocking that went all the way down the, you know, the leg, in the back of the leg, back of the calf, all the way down. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was something with the nut with the nylon material itself that they had to make it that way. I don't know if they made it that way for style, but um, you have a lot of satmar women who still wear those seam stockings because they feel um, it's their shita that oh it should be obvious that, that it should be obvious to everyone that sneeistic you're covering your legs and the best way to show that is if you wear a stocking that has a seam down the back so people see obviously you are covering your legs you're wearing stockings you're yeah. wearing stockings is also supposed to be like you know part of sneeistic dress. Um, so you know, so some you know, so some of them still wear these stockings to you know today. I, I think they're cool, by the way. No, I get I get the point. You, you if your if your main focus is trying to show the mitzvah of being sneas, you want to exemplify it and mm -hmm. bring it to light. Similar to the idea of an Arab, where you don't hold by the Arab because you don't want people to forget you can't carry on Shabbos. You know, I spoke to a few people and they didn't realize that you know you're not supposed to carry on Shabbos and that that they thought you're allowed to because of, because they're, they grew up in an era. Uh, well, I know there's a lot of Chabadniks that um, feel like the Freya de Garebi, um, the Freya de Garebi said that the, he felt that the, he didn't like these large Eruvi that went around like entire um, city areas because he said that is, that's not really the purpose of an Eruv. An Eruv is should only be for saying like, your own house if you have to bring something out on your in your backyard or something or if you want to connect a couple houses yeah. to like you want to get together Shabbos afternoon and eat outside or have some sort of social thing outside with your neighbors so in a small area um there's a story about in the old city of Yerushalayim that he was there for um for Shabbos and someone brought a bottle of wine to the table and when the Freya de Karebi, um heard from the man that oh that I brought it from my house you know, um, that's like around the corner, or whatever. The free degree wouldn't touch it. So a lot of Chabadniks hold by the free with the free degree paskin that they will not hold by a um large area, a large community area. Of. Well, yeah, because it has to do with the idea that there's only so much, so much a public space can become private. Um, and that, I mean, that's the way I always find so interesting because. A lot of non-Jews now are familiar with, you know, an Arab or a Shabbos Goy or all these other things that, you know, there's loopholes about, which kind of ties into what we talked about in the beginning of how from kind of, there really, you know, there really are ways to like kind of live your life in, in, in a more practical, sensible manner. Um, but, you know, they, they, a lot of non-Jews, I realize, feel like it's cheating if you're you know, using all these loopholes um, because you're not really doing the, what the religion asks of you. But the the, the counter response is you try holding up a 613 mitzvot plus all the rabbinical laws that have been accumulated over the past two and a half thousand years, you know, what we're supposed to do. And then you try to do everything perfectly and then not have a mental breakdown. Like you you try doing that and see what happens. You need these at Tarim so you could actually breathe in Judaism. Like they're not there to go ahead because someone's trying to be lazy. They're just, they're there for people who they physically can't do it or they emotionally or mentally can't do these 
certain laws to the T. They need some kind of heter to help them breathe. Well, it depends. well that's what that's the purpose of the rub. You know, that's the purpose of going to a of going to a rub, you know, to to see, to evaluate just, you know, how how needy you are or how lazy you are. Well, if you, want to, your if you want to torture yourself yeah. and make yourself feel like crap and think that's what you're supposed to do, I like know, a typical gullish Jew. If you want to be a gullish yeah. Jew, you can be a gullish Jew. No one's stopping you to go ahead and 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 put yourself in a little box and make sure you have all these restrictions possible to make sure you feel nice and comfortable and 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 not you know do things. Well, it depends upon what you think is restrictions. It's, it's, when you, when it's totally people, fine. I said it's totally fine. Some huh? people might think of about? as restrictions. Others feel as a method of getting to a higher spiritual level through restrictions and sometimes you want you like what you told me as i quote when i was a little kid i asked you why are we lababage and you said the lababage is like the marines you like making it hard for yourself so that's that yeah that's hard that's so what you like doing you like ones. you like making we things hard for yourself us. you enjoy making things hard and tough for yourself and that's how you want to enjoy your judaism and that's fine you want to go ahead and and make it tough on yourself that's totally okay no one's stopping you and not i'm not stopping tough. you not making it tough on myself no that's, it's i'm totally that's okay the i think the look the thing is this like i said the importance of a rough is you have to evaluate in your mind you know do i really need this hector do i read this do i need this hector for my mental and physical health okay you know or am I just being lazy? Well, you have to be honest with yourself on that level. You, I think there's um, the, there's a safer called Yisiras Hasharim, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, and you should read that to really go ahead and find some muster in yourself to ask yourself, are you being lazy or are you just putting yourself down, which caused you to be defensive, which has caused you to not fully comprehend what's going on around you, which caused you to not really see the Amos in this world because you're constantly putting yourself in a negative headspace. Well, I remember um, there was um this before I became from, mm -hmm. there was this Orthodox show I was attending and the rabbi um, was, a, was a young rabbi who had just been hired, very, very amazing person, really good. And he said that it was Erev Pesach. He says, I'm getting a lot of calls from a lot of congregants about, um, Pes about Pesach that's coming up. And he says, I'm getting the impression that a lot of the questions that are being asked are not serious questions, but are people looking to see what they can get away with mm. i don't think they like i think he he only lasted there a couple of years yeah cost on the bs for the too older, long the older the older the older generation which had this was like during the 60s so you had the older generation that actually was looking for what they could get away with and um but he, he got another job very in florida oh boy beautiful nice. florida so who wants to mess with the winters of baltimore and the snow shoveling when you can <laughs> go to florida um but i remember one time i had shyla uh at taras mishpacha shyla and i see i honestly i didn't want to see what i could get away with i wanted to find out whether or not I was definitely in need or not in need. Mm -hmm. I really did. You know, I was serious. I, I get it. Yeah. I get so it. I called the nurse midwife and we went over whatever. And she said, yes, it looks like that this was like, you know, yeah. you don't fill in the blanks. And then she said, I'm so sorry. I go, I go, oh, no, no, but I said, please don't apologize. I said, I, and I told her, she, she uh, by the way, she was, she was a non-practicing Catholic. Okay. And I said to her, I am not looking for what I can get away with. I am looking for what, really is the situation i really want to i told you i really want to do the mitzvah and i really want to do what the right thing is to do i'm glad you mentioned this because i have a jammed up amount of rabbi ness ready to just go ahead and rip that story apart first off when it comes to taras and mishpacha the main thing you should be focusing on is there are the the rabbis give head terror not to be lazy but really to make sure there's Shalom bias. If you start screwing around with Shalom bias, I think Taras Mishpacha is more important than Shalom bias. I'm sorry, sister, you're wrong. You need to make sure that your rabbi is understandable for what's going on and the situation at hand doesn't isn't necessarily you being Anita. And if there's ways to get around Anita, it's good to take that route. Because if you go ahead and be super, super strict on Taras Mishpacha, you want to cause him to be major major problems with i agree with you i really i agree with you totally on that okay i really do and as a matter of fact chabad is chabad, the rebellion of chabad the poskening in chabad is a lot more lenient than a lot of other groups um uh, but you're you know you're but the thing is a, a, a woman and her husband have to be on the same page you have to be honest and thank god your father and i were when it came to frumkite like the other things we didn't agree about when it came to frumkite 
thank God he and I were right there on the same page. I think the point is when it comes to Judaism, you have to be honest with yourself. If you if you are honest, truly honest with yourself, mm -hmm. then when you ask a Shiloh, you know it's an honest Shiloh and you just want yeah. the answer. You don't yeah. want one thing or another. And I think that's really what we boil what it boils down to. And I think it's that's why it's so important to do these studies and to learn on your own and learn with Ravrusa and have a mashpia mm -hmm. and speak to a rav. Yes. Do all these things so you can mm -hmm. stay on this honest track with yourself because you have other people holding you accountable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's well. That's the whole thing. Like a good rav, well, will take into does take into account your level, like your spiritual level, the spiritual of your family, the you know shown by his issues. A good rav does definitely take that into account. Well, yeah, that's that's why it's very important. Um, it's it's taking this into account, taking everything else into account. You, if if everybody is honest with themselves, honest with themselves, and then decide on their own to do the right thing, and everyone does that together. That is what helps create this this shalom and this 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 peace of of course of, of bringing Mashiach. That's really what you know this whole podcast episode was about with, with Tishbav, because Tishbav started this whole idea of sinas chinam, senseless hatred. And I'm just trying to wrap up the the. There was something else I was thinking about, like Tishbav, mm -hmm. in that like you asked me one time. Um, how sad I was when I first, uh, you know, learned about Tishba, whatever, and learned more about it. Yeah. And I, I thought to myself, I get sad about the um, about the loss of life. I get sad about the horrible stories of, you know, children crying for food and their parents not being, you know, the horrible stories we've read about about one mother, Neba, who actually murdered her baby and cannibalized it because and gave it to the family because they were, you know. I guess she figured the baby's going to die anyway. Might as well yeah. nourish my family. And when the kids, there's, it's a story, you know, about uh, Tisha, about the when the other kid, when the other brothers and sisters found out about it, they went to the roof of the house and jumped off and killed themselves. I mean, horrible, horrible stories. And I thought to myself, you, when, but when it comes like when someone mentions about the base of Mikdash, it's like the base of Mikdash, you know, I, it's like to be as sad about the destruction of the base of Mikdash as I am about the human suffering you know i'm not there yet i worry about I, I i relate to the human suffering but to relate to the actual destruction of the temple itself that's something that's um that's something that i'm not how can i say it that i'm not i don't feel as emotionally invested in even though maybe i should be well okay. but i'm not enough you know i well, maybe it takes a high, higher spiritual level to be as invested in the destruction of the base of Mikdash as you would be of of the the human suffering. I'll 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 put it put it to you this way. I have been in my synagogue my whole life, my whole life. I have my makom kavua. I had a couple years in Israel, traveled other places, but this is my main place. If I saw that shul on fire, mm -hmm. and it was lit on fire by a bunch of people that just hated Jews and that house itself was lit on fire and burned to the ground. Yeah. I would emotionally feel pain for that building. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what it is. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the shul on a millionth degree level. Um, And I think that's really what it comes down to it. When it, when you are, you are spiritually connected to something you know, imagine 770 being lit on fire. Oh my gosh. So, oh my gosh. Kasa Shalom. Did didn't something like that? No, you think the wall. I think of the wall story. No, that's a whole wall story. <laughs> I think we talked about it previously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, it's just, just, it's, it's definitely mm -hmm. the base of Mikdash was the, the, the main focal point of the Jews' connection to God. And it was just, you know, it was a, detriment that it was destroyed and that god willing it it, it will be rebuilt nine, nine. all right i have a good shabbos and a story now you know the rest of the story that's what i'm gonna say ruin the ruin the ending <laughs>